We're an island nation. Our history and our identity intimately connected to the ocean. But something's threatening the seas around us. It's plastic. Here, in our beautiful waters, in the very foundations of marine life, getting into the food we eat. I've joined a team of women that wants to know more about what's going on. Together, we'll embark on a journey, an expedition around the UK. We're going to be tested to our very limits. There'll be unexpected events. What the hell is that? Some magical moments. One, two, three. And as many science experiments as oh. we can manage. Let's go! So can we do it? Can a boat full of strangers rise to this challenge? Can we learn more about the water that sustains life on Earth? This is the story of a group of women and our voyage of discovery. It all starts in Plymouth. <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. Welcome. Welcome to Sea Dragon. How are you doing? We get a few minutes to stow our gear and find our bunks. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, it's heavy. So this is home. Not much space. But that is the way it works on a boat. These women have each paid for their place on the expedition. A month-long journey around the UK, measuring for plastics and raising awareness as we go. A professional crew will be looking after us. I'm here in the capacity as a deck hand. I'm basically here because I love sailing and I love the ocean. And I'm looking forward to having an amazing time going around my home turf this time, around the UK, which is going to be incredible. We have a day moored in the harbour to learn the basics, and then we begin. First, let's get off this dock. Yeah. Diane Reed is our skipper. Some of her crew have sailed before. Others, like me, have little experience at sea. Out of the port and into open water, aboard our boat. A 72-foot expedition yacht called Sea Dragon. Here we go. First time we get to be here. Here we go. Here we go. Feel good to finally be on a sail. Gorgeous. Yeah, it's great. This is my favorite thing in the world. We're sailing from Plymouth around Land's End, up the Bristol Channel to Cardiff. To start with, all is calm in the evening sun. But there's bad weather ahead. Main sheet holding. And we sail right into it. Against the wind, with choppy waves. It's a horrible combination. Ready. Most of the boat starts feeling queasy. A bit of sick on the side here. I'm just going to throw some water on it. Oh, no. It'll be sick. Watch out. The Atlantic Ocean is merciless. <sighs> and it's a rough start. Are you filming? I've got no idea. Yeah. A very long two days later, things finally start to get better. Vanessa, a fish buyer for a supermarket, emerges. I'm, I'm alive again. She's alive. Oh, sorry? That was such a horrible experience. <laughs> We're getting rid of the evidence. It never happened. I found myself in tears, sitting in the saloon, uh, having my own two-year-old tantrum. Felt well aware that it's a tantrum, but really wanting to just be home and wanting all the movement just to stop. 
but mainly we're disappointed because we haven't been able to do any science. We feel a bit defeated. Just turn the wheel, that way please. The bad weather has delayed us. And skipper Diane has to race into Cardiff Bay before the tide is too low for the boat. But we're trying to squeeze in to the lock before the gate closes, literally, not just figuratively. What does your skipper's hunch tell you about whether we're going to make it or not? Uh, my skipper's hunch tells me we're going to make it, but we're also going to be very, very careful when we go over the sill because we might have literally a few centimeters to clear. <laughs> sit down, everybody, on the bow, sit down. We make it. Just. After all the challenges of the last few days, getting into Cardiff Bay feels like a real achievement. It was actually one of the most miserable periods of my life. And I wasn't alone. These things have a bonding effect. 14 women who didn't know each other before the journey started, and now we know each other really rather too well having seen each other in all sorts of different terrible states. And that's actually been very good for team spirit. Now we're all feeling better in the sun's out. Yeah. While we've been at sea, the expedition's two youngest ambassadors have been traveling upstream. Someone's opened it and then doesn't want to. Amy and Ella Meek have founded a campaign called Kids Against Plastic. <laughs> They're too young to sail with us on Sea Dragon. Got it! Instead, they're tackling the problem of plastic pollution wherever they find it. Right, let's go. We already can't fit any more in the bag. I caught up with Ella and Dad Tim in Cardiff. How are you? Good. We're picking up litter close to the bay. That's, That's how right. microplastics get into the water. Yeah. We find disintegrating straws all over the ground. That's one of your big four plastics, isn't it? What are they again? Straws, coffee cups and lids. Bottles yep. and bags. Bottles and bags. So we can stop selling and using those. And replace them with reusables. Replace them with reusables. Does anything make a difference? Can we make a difference with this little clean here? Sort of, what's the point? Yeah, I wonder why are we doing this? Yeah. What are we achieving here? Yeah. So we're trying to pick up uh, 100,000 pieces of single-use beverage plastic. That, for us, relates to the figure of uh, 100,000 sea mammals killed every year. Engagement on shore is a vital part of this mission. So we hold a reception on board Sea Dragon for people interested in what we're doing. Just a few metres away, under the steps of the Welsh Assembly building itself, a reminder that plastic pollution is everywhere. This is really, really important. This is about getting it up the agenda, getting it in the forefront of people's minds, and uh, and really like discussing like the multifacetedness of the of the issue. Like we need to tackle it all together. We need politicians to listen to us. We need industry to know that we care about this and that we want the change now. Time's up in Cardiff. The duties have been allocated. We'll work around the clock to make it to the next port. My first night shift this evening is 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. Tuffy. Them's the breaks. <laughs> if we actually want to get up, we got to go right now. So you tell everybody down below, Sue, that we're casting off. Alrighty? I am actually. We might actually get some science done, which is brilliant. <laughs> and less seasickness. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> so we're off. Off to Belfast, across the Irish Sea. Two nights and a day of sailing. See you on the other side. But we don't get very far. Back up to neutral. First mate Holly is trying to find out what has set off the alarm. Just to advise you, we have had to stop engines and we're just drifting outside the town at the moment. I have found 
a beautiful bit of plastic, which is a very potential source of why we can get water into our engine. Okay, floor's open. Use one of the other access ports. I did just find this over the intake. Sweet! Put it back together. Yeah, I'm gonna replace this. Yay! Shitty plastic. Shitty, shitty plastic. <laughs> Language, Diane. <laughs> shitty plastic. But the problem still isn't fixed. We can't work out what's wrong, and we're not going anywhere. Six days into the voyage, with hardly any science done, the pressure is on. Our sailing expedition around the UK has ground to a halt. We're stuck in the Bristol Channel because our engine's not working. We thought we'd found the problem, a piece of plastic sucked into a filter. The plastic culprit has been removed. But now everything's put back together, we're still not moving. Looks like things have escalated slightly. We, we don't have water moving through the system yet, so I've gone back to two things. There may, that piece of plastic that we had may have only been one of. There may have been more. Diane and Holly keep searching. That is a full blockage. Well done. That's a fish. It smells like a fish, actually. Is it alive? No, I've chopped his head off. Oh. Where's your scientist? Oh, what the hell is that? The, his head is in here. Do science want this? Science! And we have the head. <laughs> so, oh my. so that is what an eel looks like. Oh, I see him. Mama. Oh, he's beautiful. I love the eels. He's a bit damaged. I didn't check the eel. <laughs> In all their combined decades at sea, the professional crew have never seen such a thing. But there's no time to dwell on it. We need to get going. We have extracted the eel from our engine, and uh, we're about to hoist anchor just outside of you and be on our way. Thank you very much, sir. Over. Let's go! <laughs> Let's go sailing! We're making our way out of the Bristol Channel, across the Irish Sea, and to Belfast. It's choppy, but we have our sea legs now. Lovely to get the sails up and finally make some progress. As night falls, there are chores below deck to do. Lynn and I tackle the worst one, pumping the bilges. <laughs> Guys, be aware of moving man to trawl. The next day, conditions are right to start trawling. And this is a very fine mesh to collect microplastics, yeah, and of course it will catch anything else. But nothing is straightforward at sea. A curious grey seal comes to investigate, and we can't risk it getting tangled in our lines. We've got another 20 minutes to wait now, guys. He's going, I want to see, I want to see. At long last, the science is underway. Ready? One, go. timing. Start timing. You're slack. This trawl collects samples from the ocean's surface, even tiny particles of plastic. It's one of our most important pieces of kit. Trawl out! Stop. Okay, hold cat. Okay. Time to investigate. The contents are filtered through sieves of different sizes and examined. I found bits of plastic with organisms growing on it. And then I also found bits of what looked to be microfibers um, floating out of a gut of a fish. We will see. We will see what he's got to tell us. I'm trying to take the testing out so we can then empty it for plastic. to check for anything that we can identify as plastic. Even the unlucky eel in the engine is fair game. That's the stomach. 
Under the microscope, Tanya found 11 microfibers and a small piece of hard plastic in his digestive tract. While we get to grips with the water pump, now far out into the Irish Sea, some visitors arrive. That was so cool. Their presence prompts a discussion about protecting this habitat. <laughs> Sarah Tamburn is a writer, sailor and management consultant. The fashion to drink water out of single-use plastic water bottles is an incredibly destructive piece of very clever marketing. So, well, you know, actually, bollocks to that. I don't want you marketing stuff that just drops crap all over my street, gets into my oceans and destroys my food chain. I'm not interested in it. So how do we encourage people who we want to be hydrated, who we want to be healthy, to drink the very good tap water, which we in the United Kingdom are blessed with? Ooh. So we're 25 miles away from dock-ish. Definitely, yeah. Awesome. Time to get dressed, at an angle, and up on deck for a last push to Belfast. <laughs> Diane demonstrates crucial sailing skills, like how to eat hot food in the rain while helming. Is it a bit wet yeah. outside, Lynch? <laughs> Do you know why he's had a bit of a cottage that look at me? <laughs> We're all drenched. But there's no time to stop and dry off. It's straight from the boat onto a beach clean, a tradition now for the crew of Sea Dragon. This one is the worst yet. You can hear the plastic crunching under our feet. It's heartbreaking to see it happen everywhere. It's layers deep. You move it apart and something looks clean, or at least mildly clean, and it's just not. It has to end from the source. It has to be people disposing of their trash in the right way. It has to be um, companies finding product, you know, finding different ways to produce their products so that it doesn't create this kind of waste. I wonder how long that's been down there, just growing underneath the brush. It's ridiculous. The rubbish piles up. Crew member and artist Deborah Moore put some of it on display at a local cafe. Mostly what we got were bottles, bottle caps, and then a lot of ducks. Oh, so someone's had a duck a fun duck. race. It's out of sight, out of mind, because it's like nobody then thinks, where do these end up? And what happens to them? So how many bags did we get from the beach team? Uh, 55. And how much time did it take together? 90 minutes. 55 bags in 90 minutes. Any chance Maybe? you could just grab the passage plan book? Have to Before we leave Belfast, the crew gathers for a briefing on the next part of the journey. Diane has some news. This is Hurricane Gert. Hi, Gert. Hi, Gert. Hurricane we Gert. were planning to sail right around the coast of Scotland. We have 40 knots potentially that we're going to see, which is a, a lot of winds. This boat could handle it, but. Um, it won't allow us to do science. It could jeopardize the whole project to go. So we're not going to go. Instead, we are going to create a whole new opportunity, and that is to go through the Caledonian Canal. The crew works late into the night to plan our new route. We are casting off and on our way out. Over. We're heading north up to Scotland for the final part of leg one. It's a short hop from Belfast to Lamlash Bay in Arran. This is a crew transformed. These are our biggest seas yet. But instead of being sick, we're having fun. The wind is behind us, pushing us along. I'm starting to understand why people get hooked on sailing. Almost there, first mate Holly has to get the sail packed away. Not easy in these conditions. One final effort, and we're into the shelter of Lamlash Bay. All in a day's work for the professional crew. We have just come into Arran. We dropped the main in some quite hairy conditions, but Holly was kind of awesome. I, I was there too. <laughs> and Holly. 
Are no. your um, muscles really hurting from your heroics on the mast earlier? No, I'm, I've got guns of steel anyway, so it's all right. <laughs> we spend the night at anchor, celebrating the end of this part of our adventure. In the morning, we head to shore to tell people about our mission and why it matters. And if you have any questions, then feel free to ask us. First, we catch up with our land-based ambassadors, Amy and Ella Meek. And you're almost three quarters full. They're here with their mum, Kerry, to talk to some local school children about ocean plastic. You both seem really passionate about the issue. Can you try and explain why it sort of fires you like that? Well, what really gets me about plastic pollution is that, I mean, this is an issue that's literally never going away. Plastic stays around on the planet forever. And whilst our generation might not have been the ones to literally manufacture this, this problem, we're going to be the ones that have to fix it, especially as the action that kind of needs to be taken on a global scale isn't being taken. And so we're really passionate about it because we know that this problem is only going to grow and we want to make it a smaller legacy that we're going to inherit as possible. That's also the mission of X Expedition, the organization yeah. running our trip. Yeah. Okay. Emily Penn is one of its founders. We're trying to tackle this issue of ocean plastics, of toxics, and many of these environmental challenges um, that are a kind of big, hard, and the goalposts are always moving. And we need to be really flexible and adaptable in the way we work so we can navigate these big global challenges and you know what we've been presented with here on this trip is a really great little micro version of that mm. some new crew members have arrived for the next leg of the journey and they'll soon experience that firsthand time to head out to sea dragon and prepare to leave before the weather closes in Lamlash Bay in the Isle of Arran. And Skipper Diane is preparing new crew members for the next part of the journey. Before leaving, some trawl samples need to be handed over. Winnie Corton Jones is a PhD student studying how microscopic pieces of plastic affect the oceans. She's arrived to pick up some of what's been collected so far. Here we've got the samples from the manta trawl, so I'm going to analyse the, the microplastics and see the quantity and what types of plastic we have in that um, for all of the mission. We'll hear more from Winnie later, but with samples safely delivered, it's time to leave the bay. The crew has been forced to change course to avoid the tail end of a hurricane that's heading towards the west coast of Scotland. The new route takes Sea Dragon out from the Firth of Clyde, up to Fort William and along the Caledonian Canal, to Inverness and Edinburgh. There's a bit of hard going to start with. But as they reach the shelter of Loch Linney, the crew is rewarded with some of the most spectacular views in Britain. It's on to Fort William and the Caledonian Canal. The shortcut for boats through land to the North Sea. Sea Dragon is carefully maneuvered into the first of 29 locks. As the crew negotiates Neptune's staircase, it's a real change of pace. One benefit is a steady supply of people to talk to about the cause. Um, sampling from microplastic, the little pieces of plastic as we go, looking at what the situation is in the waters around the UK. The first series of gates are left behind, and Sea Dragon is under motor. There are 60 miles of canals through the Great Glen. Soon, the narrow passage gives way to a series of freshwater locks, with the most famous just ahead. Fort Augustus, and the first glimpse of one of Scotland's most celebrated sites.
Loch Ness. A chance for some science in breathtaking surroundings. One, two, three. The Manta Trawl is launched into the peaty waters of the loch. This bit of the journey has given the crew a chance to find out how much plastic is in some of our inland waterways. In comes the net for a first look. Brilliant. It doesn't take long for Emily Penn to spot something that really shouldn't be there. So we found a little piece there, yeah. that bright blue colour, really obvious. Found in nature. This isn't the only experiment being done on board. The crew are also monitoring plankton, the tiny organisms at the bottom of the food chain. They're the canary in the coal mine of the oceans. Um, and it's really important to understand them. This is something that has really allowed us to gain a huge amount of very detailed on the ground information. Most phytoplankton, um, most plankton uh, research is done from satellites and it's very difficult to sometimes understand what's really happening in the water. But to get an even better idea of what's going on under the surface, the team has enlisted expert help. At the Scottish Association for Marine Science, Winnie Corton Jones is taking a first look at some of the trawl samples. This is a sample that they collected with the manta nets um, around Belfast. You can see a large number of zooplankton. We've also got quite a lot of fibers. This is just a tiny amount from this one sample that was collected. You can see a much higher density of microplastics and indeed zooplankton as well. Scientists don't yet fully understand the impact of plastic entering the base of the food chain, but it's still worrying. It's a concern for all organisms. It's easier to study those larger individuals like seabirds and whales and turtles, but the zooplankton and the plankton that we don't really see with our naked eyes um, have been found to ingest large amounts of plastic. These are the foundation species of life on our planet. So the fact that they're ingesting microplastics uh, I think is a reason for concern. Happy to at least get down there yeah, so that then we can pull the trigger yeah. and we can go. <laughs> One last challenge before Sea Dragon reaches open water. Looming in the distance is Keswick Bridge, and it's going to be a tight squeeze to get under. Their restriction is 29 meters, and we are 29 meters of air draft. And at the moment, our math looks good. We'll have about 0.8 to go under the bridge. Number crunching done, and the only thing for it is some early morning yoga. Then comes the moment of truth. Oh, oh my God. The road bridge is no match for Diane and Sea Dragon, and they head out towards Edinburgh. living life at a bit of an angle. Walking around is very difficult. You have to hold on. It's a typical North Sea welcome. I am on the lookout because visibility is dropped and we're in the North Sea. I'm with Diane, our skipper, and Sue on watch me. But the crew still manages to sample the water that's churning around them and on the approach to Edinburgh, make a discovery. Nasty nurdle. Oh my God. It's hard. These nurdles are in fact small pellets used to produce plastic products. They're easily spilled and hard to see. Well, you know, it's, we got all this seaweed and it was all wrapped up in that. Where's the nurdle pot? The nurdle pot. Nasty nurdle. I put some alcohol in it just so that it's Oh, oh no! no. It's all right. it's all right. Okay. Phew. Got it. Oh dear. It's all right. We've got it. Oh. 
It's all useful ammunition for what's to come. During the next few days in Scotland's capital, the aim is outreach and influence. So it's time to bring our most effective persuaders, the mission's junior ambassadors, Amy and Ella Meek, to a meeting at the Scottish Parliament. They've been tracing our journey on land and have a compelling message to deliver. We use around 7 million single-use coffee cups and over 30 million plastic bottles every single day in the UK alone. There's no excuse for using the amount of plastic that we do and there's definitely no excuse for not doing anything about it. Remember, plastic's been around for less than a century and we've already made it into one of the largest environmental threats facing mankind today. This is our problem, a completely man-made one. So it's up to us to fix it. Not how I imagined I'd be spending fringe, sorting trash. Down the road, we have a chance to make a different kind of impact. Crew member and artist Katie Turnbull is creating an installation using plastic from a beach clean and litter from the Edinburgh Festival. What is scary is just the time that these were all handled for. You know, this would have been three minutes to eat the sandwich. That's like three minutes on the coffee, five minutes for this burger, 15 minutes on this bag. Like, it's just such a short amount of time. And then compare it to the time that it's going to last for. We are now in the year 2417, and you have time traveled 400 years into the future. And we really actually are here to get your help. In a lab space nearby, it's getting even more creative. You can see it on the screen, but if you want to get a closer look in the microscope... The crew is putting on an immersive show to highlight our addiction to plastic. Bottles in bags. <laughs> plastic bottles in plastic bags. Have you heard of this in 2017? Was this a thing? It's so ridiculous when you say that. <laughs> it seems it... We, we, uh, we don't, we don't, we don't judge. judge. The experience is designed to help us confront some uncomfortable truths about how we live our lives. So have a look. But can we change? It is going to take time, it's going to take education, it's going to take sort of environmental justice campaigns as well because that's such a serious issue when it comes to this. But you've got hope? I've got to. And honestly, as a historian, these things are secular and society has in many ways come to a horrific point in the past and we have managed to emerge and that's maybe what my optimism is founded in today. Plenty to think about as we prepare to leave Edinburgh for our longest stretch at sea yet. There's something great about having this tiny little environment that you have to manage on your own and what you've got on board is what you get to use. So in a way it's quite a good practice really for what we're talking about this thought of having to use less and being careful about what you choose to use. Oh my God, this is beautiful. With all of that in mind, we're London bound, heading out into the North Sea and the challenges that lie ahead. It's the final part of our journey to investigate the plastic hidden in our waters. We're making our way out of Edinburgh. And the new crew members are settling in. We'll be sailing through the North Sea, around the East Coast, along the Thames to London. After a stop in a capital, we're heading back to Plymouth, where our journey began. Diana Papoulias, the mission's lead scientist, is now on board. Under her guidance, over the next 10 days, we'll do as much sampling as we can. There is stuff on there. Can you see it? Yeah. Now, maybe there is organisms, maybe it's microplastics. What's That's that? That's fiber, isn't it? Looked like it, didn't it? Big piece of polystyrene. Yeah. Past Bass Rock home to a huge colony of gannets, a reminder of the other species who depend on the ocean. The animals out here have no choice. 
they're they're living in this stuff. Um, they can't go to the supermarket and pick something else out. They can't decide I'm going to eat soy instead of fish because now we think fish is contaminated. Belfast here and here, and then Cardiff. Leguan crew member Lynn Braham has brought mussels we've been collecting to Hull University. Here, scientists use chemicals to dissolve tissue and reveal what's left over. Often, it's microplastics. To be honest, I, I go through stages where I don't sleep very well, but it, it's not just microplastics. They work on all types of different contaminants in the environment, and when you add them all together, it is quite worrying, and I do worry for the next generation, if you like. I have a daughter, and that, that's what really gets to me, is I wonder about what's, what problems are we storing up for them in the future. Out in the North Sea, we pause to take in the sunrise. We're about to receive some worrying news. A diver has gone missing. Vessels in the area have been asked to keep a lookout. Sort of the rules of the road of sailing, that if ever you hear a distress message and you are able to help because you're in the area and you're, you've got the facilities, then it's pretty much the law that you need to help out anyone you can. We continue with our journey, searching as we go, and something is spotted in the water. In these circumstances, any potential sighting must be followed up. And it's arm up in the air, position yep, on the clock. Diane initiates a man overboard drill. It's not what we hope to find. Birthday balloon. There were two. A second sighting, this time an even larger clump of balloons, miles from the shore. Uh, it's a child's happy birthday balloon, and you can see that it's a two-year-old's birthday, which is lovely, and I wish the child in question a, a very happy birthday. The sad thing about this is that this balloon, which is probably quite fresh, it's still got a lot of its gold colour on it, so the child is probably still only two. Um, the balloon in the marine environment will last a lot longer than the child. This would stay in the sea, breaking down into smaller and smaller, but still very toxic pieces for hundreds of years. Sadly, the search is called off and we sail on. We're in the middle of our longest period at sea, three days and three nights of sailing. But the wind is with us and we speed down to London. London VTS, Sea Dragon, we are now within sight of the barrier, over. Sea Dragon, London VTS, so proceed on and take Foxtrot How cool is this? Isn't it cool? It's pretty damn neat. But the best is yet to come. Oh, it's lifting. Tower Bridge is being raised for Sea Dragon. Anyway, anyway. After all the weeks of sailing, it is a magical moment. <laughs> It's quickly back to reality, though, as Sea Dragon pulls over to wait for a space to dock. Well, we do have some single-use plastic here. How appropriate. Yeah. So have we actually pulled up next to a rubbish bar? We yeah. have. Is that intentional? I don't think so. But the pile of trash is in some ways useful, offering us a chance to think about the challenge of consuming less. Boats are very good training for living in a small world because it is, you know, your boat at sea is a small world and we only have one planet and we're living as if we've got three. Despite the sight and smell next to us, co-mission leader Sue is delighted. That was a big moment, wasn't it? Yeah. It's huge. What's made you so emotional? I've been working on this for 18 months and the fact that we were able to come through to our bridge and it opened up for us is just absolutely mind-boggling for me. Yeah. I'm too rude to speak, really, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Back through the bridge and into our berth. Just in time for mooring up. The rain's arrived. Welcome to London. Now it's the capital's turn to hear the message this time via art made from plastic collected on the banks of the Thames. We catch up with the Meek family before the girls head back to school. 
we've had an amazing response from the people that we've spoken to and just a really positive vibe coming from it with people really keen to take action and try and combat the issue. And do you think uh, that people have been more willing to listen? Well, actually, being kids, people do think, oh, wait, there's a kid telling me not to use plastic. Maybe I should listen. <laughs> have the girls inspired you to care more about plastics? Definitely, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's in our, our mindset now. It's just, even if we're thirsty, and the only thing that we could get, the only way we could get water was to buy a plastic bottle, we'd go thirsty. You know, we're that, we're that committed and we would feel like we'd, we'd not, we're not doing the right thing if we resort to these convenience plastics. With Sea Dragon moored in such an iconic location, it's another chance to reach as many people as we can. Do you think that this mission will have made a difference? on these big issues i think it's really hard to say now i think it's it's yeah it's little changes that just sort of magnify over time i think we've definitely made a difference to the women that have sailed with us yeah and i think they're going to become true. they're going to become powerful ambassadors we've seen that in the past i i don't doubt for a second that they won't have this in their consciousness for the rest of their lives Early morning and the crew's ready to leave London. We cast off for the last time. Stop rabbiting on. <laughs> Sampling the water in the Thames as we go. Oh yeah, I can see a piece of plastic already. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> in a very full sock. We're going to be here for some time. How many pieces of plastic have we pulled out so far? Probably about ten. It's just all shredded. It might be a sanitary item. Nice. Oh. So how many years will it take for these items to break down? It never breaks down. It's into smaller, it's just smaller just pieces. Gets smaller, smaller pieces. It's worse in Deborah's sieve. Duckweed crunchy with microbeads. As I'm really poking around in it, it, all these colours are jumping out. It's like, whoa, this is what we've been talking about. And it, and it is full of them, and this was just a tiny sample of Thames water. The act of bearing witness is having a profound effect on some of the new crew members. You can't unknow this. You can't go back to how you were. Things have to change. And for me, it's, it's a real tipping point in what I need to do going forward. It's, it's really brought home that, yes, it's a problem. People talk about it, people, it's growing awareness, but actually we have to do something really quickly. But problem solving has to wait. Our lucky run with the weather ends and the last phase of the journey is a tough one. When it all stops, we are rewarded. A reminder, if we needed it, that the ocean is a special place. The harbour beckons. Sea Dragon has come full circle. That the sea is what connects us and, and the ocean is what holds us together and we tend to think of the ocean as a divider when it's a uniter and for me that's been a really strong reminder of that. For now though, it's time to say goodbye. One, two, three! I've been inspired by these women and their desire to rise to this vast, complex challenge. And because of this experience, Many of us are going home with a new understanding of what's at stake. We've had a truly unforgettable journey around our beautiful islands. And ultimately, one full of hope that making a difference, protecting these precious waters, turning the plastic tide, is within our reach. <laughs>